speaker today is code 5040, speaking on the topic, is the United Nations International Court of Justice, or the ICJ, a safe haven for environmental accountability? Again, that's, is the United Nations International Court of Justice, the ICJ, a safe haven for environmental accountability? In a recent speech delivered to foreign ministers, the Chinese President Xi Jinping attacked a lot of climate activists using homophobic and racist slurs. It was a hateful and unhinged speech that actually has a lot of Floridians calling him electable. <laughs> and although Alligator Man is a big fan of Xi Jinping, it's clear that the United Nations rights for climate change probably isn't. Because according to the Atlantic Council on May 17th of this year, the United Nations International Court of Justice is a international system that tries and litigates international problems, including those regarding environmental concerns, such as a recent flooding within Indonesia, in which NPR recently reported that while rescuers are still looking for survivors of this Indonesian flood, they pause every single 10 minutes to hear the screams of both women and children. Yet, every single 10 minutes, all they hear is silence. But it's not just because of these moments of pause that we ask today's question, but it's also because the environment infects not just me and you, but the next generation that we ask, is the United Nations International Court of Justice, better known as the ICJ, a safe haven for environmental accountability? And the answer, unfortunately, is no because of its jurisdiction failures. More specifically, first, it has no strings on corporations. Second, because of the giant's polluter's influence. And finally, because it cannot humanize the effects of climate change. Now, countries like China have actually passed or printed out more than 800 pages detailing how they're going to cl climate change. But the first solution probably should have just been don't print 800 pages of anything. <laughs> now, though China isn't the best at communicating environmental accountability, neither is the ICJ. The first reason, and why the International Criminal Court of Justice isn't necessarily the best safe haven for environmental accountability, is because it has no strings on corporations. Today, corporations make up the largest amounts of pollution in the international community. According to the International Crisis Group, it contextualizes just two years ago that more than 95% of all oil spills can be stemmed back from corporations. Yet many of the times, uh, they get untouched by the ICJ, mainly because they have no strings on these corporations. Foreign Policy Magazine continues to articulate on May 17th of this year that whenever the ICJ tries to subpoena a lot of CEOs or corporate leaders, they have no power to force them into trial. Additionally, such as the MB Makashio oil spill, whenever they spilled more than 1,000 tons of oil within the Indian Ocean, millions of marine life and also people's homes were decimated. Yet at the same time, no CEO, no leader was tried by the ICJ, showing that the ICJ's jurisdiction over corporations is highly limited. And whenever they make up the largest amounts of pollution, environmental accountability truly can't be met by the UN. Now, a recent report found by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change found that pollution within the Indian Ocean has gotten so bad that it's so filled with plastic that they're probably using the same surgeon as the Kardashians. And although the Indian Ocean is not necessarily safe towards climate change, it's clear that the ICJ isn't going to make it any better. The second reason and why the ICJ isn't going to be a safe haven for environmental accountability is because of the pollution influence of giants. Today, the United Nations Security Council has a lot of influence on the ICJ's own power. For example, 
Ian Bremmer, the director of the Eurasia Group, found just a year ago that today the United Nations Security Council is made by both permanent and non-permanent members like the United States, India, China, and Russia. All of these countries also happen to be the largest global polluters, but they also have a large influence on the ICJ as they make up the panel who litigates problems of environmental concerns. But as the Wall Street Journal continues to contextualize, on January 15th of this year, that even though the UN Security Council preaches green initiatives, countries like Germany and even the United States still depend on more than 60% of their energy from hydrocarbons and fossil fuels, showing that they're still incentivized to side with people and companies that not necessarily actually align with the ICJ. And when more than 30 people have died due to coal fumes within Bangladesh, more than 20 people have been hospitalized from sulfur poisoning in Kazakhstan, it's clear that the ICJ truly isn't going to be a safe haven for accountability. Now, the United Nations is recently looking for peacekeepers who fit the description of being tall, thin, and women. Yeah, that's probably why I've been having so many calls from the United Nations. <laughs> and although peacekeepers are working for the United Nations, it's clear that they're not humanizing the problem. According to the Wall Street Journal, this time again, in an article published on May 15th of last year, a lot of the problems within climate and environmental concerns are local issues. But at the same time, the United Nations ICG has really no arm to extend to local individuals. For example, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace's European director, Judy Dempsey, found just two years ago that whenever the ICJ tries to litigate problems for climate change, they rely on regional workers. But at the same time, there are very few regional workers that can reach out to local problems. That's why many times more than 30% of the environmental concerns are largely ignored by the ICJ. Whenever the people on the ground are who matter when it comes to environmental concerns, and the ICJ can't even humanize those issues, it's clear that they are not a safe haven for environmental accountability. So considering that silence is the last thing this country or the world needs when it comes to addressing climate change, it's essential that we ask again today's question. Is the United Nations International Court of Justice, better known as the ICJ, a safe haven for environmental accountability? The answer is no, because of jurisdiction failures. More specifically, because they have no strings attached to corporations. Second, because of the pollution influence of giants. And finally, because they can't humanize the effects of climate change. Showing that climate activists probably aren't the biggest fan of Xi Jinping. Yet unfortunately, when it comes to uniting the world together on addressing environmental issues, they can't rely on the International Court of Justice either. Let's start with your second point. Can you give me a single example when a giant climate polluter like China, the United States, or India was on trial at the ICJ and was able to judge themselves? It's not that they're on trial, it's that they're making the panel for the people who are judging corporations as well. And whenever the United States, China, and India still heavily favor corporations that actually pollute and cause the environmental concerns, it's clear that their influence on the panel itself is going to be swayed ultimately I'm, making sure that the ICJ can't be a safe haven. I'm not talking about corporations like in your first point. I'm talking about the countries themselves in your second point. You talked about how countries like China make up the litigation panel at the ICJ, but wouldn't countries like the United States be more incentivized to judge them harshly, especially given their political differences? Well, whenever the United States still heavily relies on fossil fuels and hydrocarbons, their interests are still aligned with oil. Sure, the United States can say they are remaining impartial, but all of the promises that the United States has truly made towards climate change has been ignored. Let's just take the Paris Climate Accords. They promised that years ago, yet our carbon emissions are higher than ever, and we're still working with hydrocarbon countries, such as Venezuela, and even countries like China as well. So in order to be a real safe haven for environmental ad uh, 
for environmental accountability, the ICJ needs to ban all climate usage of carbon whatsoever? That's not true. It's just whenever the United States and China has this influence to make sure that there can't necessarily be an impartial panel, it's clear that environmental accountability can't necessarily be reached. All right, finally, let's go to your third point about humanizing the impacts of climate change. Can you give me an example of a case at the ICJ where they failed to listen to regional or local workers? It's not that they failed to listen, it's whenever these cases are just simply ignored. More than 30% of the environmental cases don't even end up in the ICJ. And whenever people can't get their cases in the hands of this court of justice, it's clear it can't be a safe haven. Our fifth speaker will be cross-examined by our fourth speaker, which was code 545040. All right, so congratulations on a great speech. I just have one overarching question. You mentioned that new emerging technologies are the solution to this water crisis, right? Yes. So whenever it's new emerging technologies, haven't countries already been working on developing technologies for decades now? What makes it now that technology will be a viable solution? Yeah, definitely. It isn't just the fact that this technology has been worked on, but that it needs to be implemented. Look no further than the wastewater treatment plants. There needs to be an injection of money for companies to use them. But once they use them, they get their dividends back. Okay, let's take a look at your first point then. Most of the countries faced with this water crisis are probably landlocked nations, right? The vast majority of them, yes. Okay, but the majority, so... But the majority of the international community also faces them because they're all interconnected. Okay, so if these landlocked countries are going to use desalination plants, where are they gonna put that? Just a salty cup of water? That's actually not exactly how desalination works in terms of a global economy. Take, for example, Saudi Arabia, a country that is bordered by oceans. It uses desalination to create fresh water and then sells them to other countries or gives them through international agreements. That's so, the key part you're missing. So if countries like Saudi Arabia are making this into a commodity, wouldn't that just make it even more expensive? And whenever water is commercialized, wouldn't that not solve this water shortage problem itself? I'd argue that desalination will in the long term make water cheaper because if there's less naturally available water, demand even in countries that border the ocean will still increase, leading to unnecessary price hikes for average water. Okay, let's take a look at your second point then. Whenever developed nations are the ones funding most of the international effort, what incentive do they actually have to give this money towards drip irrigation whenever most of these developed nations probably aren't suffering from problems like water shortages? In fact, they are. The reason that many developed nations are suffering is because water governance is interconnected. Issues in Mexico affect issues in the United States. So by giving Mexican farmers drip irrigation, a river upstream, like the Rio Grande, can give southern Arizona or New Mexico water. 